In my many, many years of rewatching Avatar, I've often found myself asking the question of, what is it exactly that keeps me coming back year after year? What is that part of the series that keeps it so, so timeless, but also so timely at the same time? Is it the message of Avatar itself, or is it just a comfort show that I grew up with? Is it the beautiful animation and the intense bending battles? Or is it just the world of Avatar itself? Well, let's be honest, there is no intrigue here, you've read the title. I think it's a mixture of those things and countless others which no doubt warrant a video of their own. But at the very, very heart of all of that, I think is Aang himself. The thing with writing main characters, especially in stories that are not aimed at mature audiences, is that they must be some sort of role model. Something that naturally imposes limits on the types of stories you can really tell. Even if they do something bad-ish, it will more so serve as a lesson rather than a distinct character trait or flaw. Or on the flip side, other stories purposely make their main characters extremely bland to allow the audience to project themselves onto the main role. There is a very, very good reason why people often meme certain anime protagonists being copy-pasted. It's not just lazy writing or copying or whatever. It is purposely meant to be a self-insert. It is a intentionally muted character that is often just meant to be an escapist power fantasy for the viewers. Aang, in that sense, falls in the former camp of functioning as a almost perfect role model. But there too, we encounter another problem. That being that a character can just be too perfect and become uninteresting. In episodic stories, this isn't really a huge problem. There, you can tell stories of smaller challenges where the character can grow within that self-contained little narrative. With stories like that, you don't really need to worry about the continuity of that growth. In a long-running series with a continuous story, however, perfect characters are just very, very boring. Think of someone like Light from Death Note. He is perfect in every sense of the word, except that he is a massive narcissist and has a god complex. It's that part of his character that drives basically the entire story. If it wasn't for those flaws, there really is no Death Note. But okay, Death Note isn't exactly a story that is aimed at non-mature audiences. So think of someone like Hermione from Harry Potter. She too is a perfect student, she can overcome just about every problem, etc, etc. But she can also be very opinionated and often too blunt, which drives many of her interpersonal conflicts. And that only becomes more prevalent as she grows up alongside the audience. With the later books and movies having far more conflict than the first, which are all about just solving the mysteries and problems within Hogwarts. So even with these almost perfect characters, they usually must have some sort of flaw to make them engaging. But again, you've read the title, so you already know that that's not what we're talking about. So how does Avatar tackle this problem of Aang being extremely good in just about every situation, yet still tell an enthralling story of many ups and downs? Because you're watching a Kuroto video, it is time to go on another tangent. Because I also think it's worth noting that at the heart of Aang's character is also a coming-of-age story. But one that I think puts a significant spin on it. As an example, I mentioned Hermione a second ago. But Harry's story is just about the most straightforward coming-of-age story, with it quite literally detailing the story of his growth from a young child learning of his potential, to him later becoming a full-fledged wizard and eventually sending his own kids to Hogwarts. It spans many years and details all the twists and turns of going from a first year to growing up in a world that turns out to be far darker than may initially seem. With Avatar, on the other hand, we have to remember that the entire story takes place over the course of like 6 to 10 months. So by default, there really isn't an explicit coming of age, if you will. But that's only a technicality and I think is actually secondary. Because I think the most important twist it puts on that is with Aang's different responsibilities, beliefs, and identities, if you can call them that. As in, the monk Aang, the Avatar Aang, and the 12-year-old kid Aang all represent different themes of his story and the story of Avatar as a whole. You know that meme of watching Spongebob as a kid and enjoying his and Patrick's shenanigans. But as you get older, your appreciation slowly shifts to Squidward's characterization instead. Yeah, well, I think much of what keeps us coming back to Avatar is unironically because much of that same shift in perspective is present within just Aang and is even further accentuated by the likes of Zuko, Iroh, and everyone else. I think the monk side of Aang is that role model I mentioned before. The sort of perfect outlook on life that I think many of us strive for. He's a pacifist through and through, to the point that he even becomes a vegetarian. He doesn't want wealth, fame, or power, he strives for peace, and treats everyone with absolutely no prejudice, and so on. Though despite its seeming simplicity, I think this is one that has changed the absolute most as I've grown older and my perspective on the world has evolved. 
While the Air Nomad way of life paints this idyllic image of no earthly attachments and a simple and humble way of life, I think the natural question that arises is, is it really that simple? Could it be? Throughout Aang's story, we see him grapple with the question of whether or not the Air Nomad way of life is truly sustainable, especially for the Avatar. Somewhat paradoxically, from a certain point of view, their way of life can seem more than a little self-absorbed. Because they purposely aim to detach themselves from the world at large, they also turn a blind eye to the many injustices of that world. During the Kyoshi era, they were accused of just that, not caring about the outside world and simply distracting themselves with their own little isolated perfect ecosystem. So from that perspective, it seems like their existence is somewhat naive. At the same time though, we also know that their way of life isn't just with the aim of reaching this enlightened state with no care for the world. No, far from it, it is actually to preserve spiritual knowledge and offer guidance for generations of avatars to come. So in that sense, that supposed selfishness is actually the purest form of selflessness. They give up their own desires and goals with the one single goal of helping the world maintain balance. And again, while I talk about the wider avatar lore, I think all of these themes and questions are present within just Aang's story. So when I watch the series today, I no longer see the monk way of life as this pinnacle of existence but rather as a thing to strive for while acknowledging the realities of the world. One part of my brain tells me that it's a doggy dog world, people do whatever it takes to get ahead, and if I don't do it, why am I handicapping myself for literally no tangible reason? That person's struggling, why would I help them? No one helped me, and this constant escalation of quote-unquote improvement in every avenue of life is not slowing down, so why should I? But on the other, if everyone thinks like that, then what's the point? We're not robots, surely there must be someone to preserve traditions and a less go-go-go type of lifestyle, right? Which very, very nicely leads us on to the second third of Aang's character, that being the Avatar. Unlike the monk that is this nigh-idealistic depiction of values and morals, the Avatar very much depicts that more balanced and far more complex and adult angle, one that is full of conflicting and often self-contradictory thoughts and emotions. It is a dog-eat-dog -dog world, but how do we coexist in such an environment? I mean, the Avatar as a concept is explicitly planted right in the middle of every single clashing ideology and worldview. It is their literal job to balance them and find a way to coexist. We in the real world aren't exactly stopping Fire Nations in our day-to-day, -day, but the struggles Aang faces in his role as the Avatar I think can be likened to a crisis of self for just about any person out there. In the very, very first episodes, when Katara asks Aang why he didn't tell them that he was the Avatar, he straight up says, because I never wanted to be. He is placed in a position that scares him, he is forced to live up to an impossible legacy. And while in the world of Avatar, he is carrying the weight of the entire world on his shoulders, on a strictly personal level, I think each and every one of us have been in a similar situation where it feels like you are carrying that same weight. We are talking about cartoons, so I don't want to get like super dark, but a tragedy happens and suddenly you find yourself caring for someone, trying to fill in the gap that is now left behind. You never chose this position and you clearly never wanted any of this, but it is now forced upon you. You can't stand by because someone else needs you. Just like it is Aang's duty to take up the mantle of the Avatar, it is yours to help your loved ones, friends, acquaintances, or just about anyone else who might need your help. But at the same time, we are not heroes. Aang ran away after he learned that he is the Avatar. And now a hundred years of war later, there is a lot of regrets. What if he hadn't ran away? What if he was never the Avatar? Would things be different? Would a different Avatar avoided the war altogether? Surely, Roku would be better at solving the problem. It is again, a deeply personal story of insecurity, regrets, imposter syndrome, and all of those sorts of things jumbled up into a big ol' ball of anxiety. What if you had noticed those early signs of whatever might have happened? Would it have been different? Is it your fault for not noticing them? Again, these are all things we've all probably thought about countless times at 3am, exactly because Aang's regrets about not embracing his avatarhood exploits that core human doubt. I distinctly remember that in my little walnut brain many years ago, I thought the storm was kind of a mid-episode. It deals with all sorts of regrets and stuff, but I was a small walnut brain, like, give me the action, right? But watching it now, it is one of my absolute favorites of book one, precisely because how much deeper it truly goes. It is no longer just a childish surface level explanation of, oh, so that's why Aang was in the iceberg for a long time, and he misses his friend Gyatso, that's very sad. No, it is a very, very real identity crisis and the impossible weight of living up to a great legacy. 
You think your grandpa is like really, really cool? Well, you'll have to be just like him or better not to be a disappointment, right? All those things you've been taught, well, maybe there'll come a day when you will have to be the teacher. It is a heavy, heavy burden, one that I think each and every one of us carries to a certain extent, and one that is distinctly different from that idealistic monk perspective of detaching yourself from the world and not really lingering on what everyone else thinks of you. In Aang's position, perception is very, very important. He can be just a peaceful monk, he needs to be the avatar. And in a similar vein, walking the path of an avatar can be a very, very lonely walk. Even with the most basic of things, the air scooters, Aang was immediately shunned because of the preconceived notions that the mere title of the avatar carries. It is something that is completely out of Aang's control, and in terms of their friendship, it changes absolutely nothing. But still, their entire dynamic is suddenly flipped upside down. And later in the series, that is made even more explicit, with Guru Patik saying that in order to become a fully-fledged avatar, Aang must give up his feelings for Katara. The Avatar is forced to detach themselves from their personal feelings and emotions, yet still has to anchor themselves to the world at large. Or, you know, just like an adult must sometimes make very, very hard decisions as to who they may be forced to cut out of their lives for the betterment of everyone else. It is often the Avatar who has to make sacrifices to ensure that everything keeps going smoothly, or worse yet, someone isn't endangered. There are about a dozen other smaller things that you could talk about with Aang's role as the Avatar. But to loop back to that question why I think it keeps us coming back, I think it's that more balanced and introspective adult angle that again shifts our perspective on how we view the series. Underneath that always pure and honest monk is a far more complex, often confused and conflicted person. Which also neatly brings us to the final part of Aang's character, because at the end of the day, Aang is just a kid. A prodigy to be sure, but a goofy little guy. For much of what I've just talked about, it is a bit doom and gloom. The purity of the monks being somewhat naive, the painful regret and self-doubt of the Avatar all might make you think that I am actually talking about Berserk. But we have all seen the series and that is not at all the majority of it. Much of it is a collection of whimsical adventures that only occasionally get super deep. And exactly as I talked about with the other parts of Aang's character, the wacky goofy Unagi writing guy is just as important with it representing that fun-loving childlike wonder that lives within each and every person. There is a genre in anime and manga called Iyashuke. Probably butchered the pronunciation, but when translated literally, it means healing. These stories typically involve very little to no conflict and deliberately focuses on things like nature, the mundane, and the many little delights of life to, as the name suggests, heal or soothe the audience. The most obvious examples of this is something like Laid Back Camp, but series like Mushishi and Freiren more or less fit the bill as well. Which by the way, if you like the Swamp episode and Aang's spirit world shenanigans, watch Mushishi, you will love it, it's like a whole series of just that. But yes, the reason why I went off on this little tangent is that while Avatar's big picture story doesn't really fit the genre as it's commonly described, I still think that it's the best way to summarize why we all love Aang's whimsical side so so much. It's those one-off adventures where we kinda sorta get into trouble, but not really, that gives the story this oddly peaceful and soothing vibe. Little stories of personal growth, like Aang getting a little big-headed on Kyoshi Island, and of course his famous marble trick. Him wanting to know his fortune and whether or not Katara likes him. Even his very creative disguise when entering Omashu. All of them have just the perfect amount of goofiness so as to be endearing, but not come off as too childish. And perhaps most importantly of all, it is that light-hearted, blow-stakes and adventurous spirit that accentuates the more serious sides of the story. The genius thing about Aang is that it interweaves all three of these personalities to take you on an emotional roller coaster all the way through, with his tale in Ba Sing Se working as the perfect small-scale example of that. The overall story isn't exactly a joyous one, with Aang still searching for Appa but stumbling upon the Ba Sing Se Zoo, which is not doing so great. But that's when the episode is flipped on its head and we get a little bit of that healing vibe again. With Aang, after some controlled chaos of course, creating a whole new little zoo. It combines the 12 year old whimsical side of Aang, not really thinking things through that much, with the monk who just wants the animals to have a nicer living space, with the more mature avatar side, more so using this opportunity to reflect on his search for Appa. 
And also side notes about the still healing thing, I also don't think it's a coincidence that Aang's story comes after Iroh's. I think this was very much meant to destroy you emotionally, but then, as you're still crying, you watch Aang sort of make people a little bit happier and get better himself. And then of course, you just get slapped with Sokka's goofiness. But yes, point being that, much like with Luffy for example, it's because of that light-hearted vibe all throughout that the serious and touching moments really hit you like a truck. But okay, why does the thumbnail and or video title say perfect but flawed? What does that even mean? And more importantly, what is so genius about it? Well, I think the character of Aang can very easily be seen as too perfect. In that, he has no bad traits, he is a bending prodigy and overcomes every challenge put in front of him, he is a likable wacky little guy and generally, well, he is perfect. But the thing is, while that is still true, he has doubts. Not flaws per se, but very, very human doubts. The genius thing about Aang's character is exactly that. The fact that I went from being a little walnut brain laughing at Aang's antics and wanting to paint a blue arrow across my forehead, to now sitting here and talking about the uncertainties of the monk ideologies and the conflicts of the Avatar, perfectly demonstrates how those comparatively tiny additions to his character have made his story timeless. I think it's those three sides of Aang's character that we've been talking about that also sort of mirror stages of maturity and how one's perspective might shift over time. You start as that little boy and those marble tricks, just some childish fun. As you grow older and develop a more rounded personality, the monk seems like a perhaps slightly idealized image but one worth striving for. One with no explicitly bad or malicious traits, just a image of purity and fairness. But as you enter adulthood, the Avatar, a more complex and not so perfect perspective and the impossible burden that the title carries is the one that sticks out the most. Fears over not being the right one, fears of not being good enough, fears of never getting it, of never living up to your forefathers' legacies. Fears of ruining the cycle altogether, of somehow having to traverse a world full of uncertainty, malice, and often hatred. I think the reason we keep coming back to Avatar is because it has struck the balance of having this perfect protagonist whose perspective is worth striving for, but instead of giving him some explicit flaw to give him depth, he is rather grounded with this more ambiguous fear of uncertainty. To put it differently, rationally speaking, Aang running away from his avatar hood is not a flaw. Firstly, well, he is a literal kid, but far more importantly, everything that came afterwards was outside of his control. He didn't know that Sozin would launch a war and literally attempt to wipe out his kind. I mean, how could he even imagine something like that? But couldn't you say the same exact thing for just about every single worry you have on a day-to-day -day basis? In the age of always wanting to be informed about everything, we are probably exposed to things that add nothing but what-ifs to our lives that we could never even control. But okay, that's just one thing. For things happening right now, at least there's the argument of being informed. But what about worries about the past? We all know it's pointless, right? Thinking about those things you said or didn't say like five years ago, why worry about that? The reason why I brought up that healing angle is because even this pseudo-character flaw that's not really a flaw shows us that even the perfect monk has doubts. Fantasy is just an extension of the human condition. Stories told about people wrapped up in a slightly shinier form. And what better way to explore that human condition than to go straight for fundamental human insecurity and fear? Just like an immortal elf girl can stunlock you, a monk boy crying in a cave about not being a good avatar has the same power to tell you that it's okay. Bad things happened and it is an uncertain world out there. But right now, try to be the best you can. Strive to be like that humble monk. Don't lose yourself in that endless pursuit of what once was and what you believe you should be. Keep your head high. Be that wacky goofy 12 year old. In the words of a certain someone, we can't concern ourselves with what was, we must act on what is. The genius thing about Aang is that depending on what stage of life you are in, inside of you there is always a part of that marble spinning goofy guy, the monk and the avatar. What keeps us coming back is that immature maturity that we see within Aang. We don't relate to him because he's a blank page, he's not just like me for real for real because of some quirky character flaw. No, it's because within all of us, there is a fun-loving, carefree and adventurous spirit just like the male shoot riding Aang. And generally speaking, I think we all try to be good and to treat others fairly. But every now and then, that more balanced perspective kicks in for a quick reality check. Sometimes a very unwelcome one that breaks you out of that stride and perhaps calls you to some urgent duty. 
The thing that truly connects the young versions of us following the gang's adventures for the very first time, the adult versions of us watching it for the 100th time and Aang himself, is that eventually, we all become the Avatar just trying to maintain balance, be it in the world or maybe just within ourselves. And that's the video. Can you tell that I'm in an Avatar mood? Because I am definitely in an Avatar mood and the wait for the live action version is low-key killing me. But anyway, with that, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons and YouTube members who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. And let's also give a warm welcome to the newest members of the team, JT Hill, Malaika Firi, and Elias Luftig. I am so sorry if I butchered the names, I absolutely did. But without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my rambling, so seriously, thank you, thank you. And also, side note, when and if we get any more Avatar news anytime soon, I'm covering all of that on the second channel, so if you're interested in the latest developments, do give that a look. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye!